So uh, welcome to this month's Repronim webinar. We're super, super happy to have uh, Lee Liu with us. Lee was a Repronim uh, fellow uh, in our second cohort. Uh, she is currently an associate professor with joint at University of Southern California with joint appointments in the Division of Biokinesiology and Physical Therapy and the Department of Neurology. She'll be talking to us today about some of the exciting out growth of her uh, uh, fellowship uh, effort uh, in terms of creating a program called Repro Rehab, building a reproducible rehabilitation research education program for the medical rehabilitation community. So without further ado, Lee. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> so I will also add that I am also in the Division of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy uh, and at the Stevens Neuroimaging and Informatics Institute, just in case anyone from any of those affiliations happens to watch this. I am proud to be a part of all of them. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to talk about repro rehab, and you know my talk is really directed for the repro nim community to just kind of share uh, what we've done as an offshoot of repro nim. Um, as Dave mentioned, I am an associate professor at USC, but I also am a former repro nim fellow, um, and so uh, this was really my repro nim fellow project, uh, and I think it's become something a lot more exciting than I had initially anticipated. So. Uh, today, I'll just uh, do a brief preamble of kind of how I got here. Uh, then I'll talk about the overview of our Repro Rehab goals, um, our progress. This was our first year of Repro Rehab. Um, so I'll talk about kind of how that went. Uh, next steps and then discussion, uh, because I think and hope that there are probably a lot of people out there that may want to also create um, offspring from Repro NIM. So. Uh, just as a preamble, I, by training, am clinically an occupational therapist. I am also a neuroscientist. Um, I initially got into brain hacks and open science through Dr. Cameron Craddock. I was interviewing at a lab where he was uh, for a postdoc, and we just became friends that way. And um, he kind of opened my eyes to the whole world of open science and data sharing and hackathons and all of that. Um, so. I really loved that community um, and I kind of stayed a part of it as I moved through my postdoc and into my faculty position. Um, but I, I do give a special shout out to Cameron for all of this. Um, I learned about and joined Repro NIM as a fellow in the 2020 to 2021 year. Um, I saw it posted and I thought, oh, like these, you know, with Repro NIM, you obviously learn about reproducible practices for neuroimaging. Um, and help to kind of spread the word about reproducible practices. Um, and when I saw that opportunity, I thought, oh, this is such a great way for me to actually uh, put aside time to do these things because I had always wanted to, but I hadn't really um, dedicated any specific time for it. So I was really happy to have that opportunity. Um, I, as part of my fellow year, uh, I started thinking like, you know, all of the things in Repro um, NIM were really developed more for like uh, people in neuroimaging who are already really like pretty proficient at programming. Um, but for me personally, I got into programming when I was a grad student because I had to, I had never written a line of code before. I didn't even know anything about it, um, but I joined a lab as a research assistant um, that did a lot of neuroimaging. And so obviously I learned how to use, uh, at that time I learned MATLAB and SPM. Um, and I remember spending many, many nights uh, and days and uh, in between just uh, Googling things, uh, trying to like modify my senior lab mates code, um, asking lots of questions um, and just basically trying to teach myself how to program from scratch. Um, and I thought, you know, there are probably a lot of other people similar to me with backgrounds, either clinical backgrounds or um, neuro backgrounds that maybe don't have experience with programming. And wouldn't it be great if we could build a program that kind of bridges the gap between people who have never written a line of code before and then people who want to be able to use a lot of the more advanced reproducible resources put out by ReproNAM. Um, so that's kind of where the idea came from. Uh, it started on that brainstorming spreadsheet that we have as uh, under ReproNAM. Uh, and then just kind of grew out into this R25 uh, research educational program grant that I submitted in fall of 2020. Um, and then I had to, it was reviewed and um, I had to do a resubmission in spring of 2021. And then it was finally funded in March of 2022. 
So um, it's been a little bit of a journey to get here, but it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, it's a five-year grant. We just completed our first year and we have a wonderful leadership educational team, which I'm showing you down here, including Repronym's uh, very own Dave Kennedy, as well as JB Pauline. Uh, and my colleagues, James Finley and Keith Lowe's, who are both from the neurorehabilitation side of things. Um, and then we also have a fantastic program manager, Coralie Finord. Um, so together, we put together a program. Uh, and so I will spend the rest of the time talking about you know, what Repro Rehab is, uh, what we aim to do, and uh, what it's looked like this first year. Um, so essentially, uh, you know, as everyone here probably knows, data science methods, which rely on computer programming for data intake, management, storage, and analysis, can increase the reproducibility of research, um, especially if you use code and software um, that's reproducible to share what you've done. However, a lot of rehabilitation researchers um, with either clinical backgrounds or basic science backgrounds lack the fundamental training in programming to be able to easily adopt these practices. Um, so even if you say, just put your stuff on GitHub, like that is actually quite intimidating to a lot of people. Um, so our new Repro Rehab program, which stands for Reproducible Rehabilitation Research, uh, aims to build a sustainable national workforce of rehabilitation researchers equipped with basic data science skills in five years. So the way that we aim to do this is with a threefold approach. So first, uh, it's, it's always a little complicated for how best to explain this, uh, but we essentially recruit uh, eight TAs and we initially set out to recruit 20 learners, uh, but we ended up with 25 this first year, which was awesome. Uh, and we put them into a small pods of one TA to every two to three learners. Um, and they were grouped by similar research interests and learning needs, as well as kind of skill levels, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, during an eight week boot camp, we provide most of the content, but as we found this first year, the TAs also create their own content specific for their learners needs. Um, and the learners learn through asynchronous like online YouTube videos and um, like tutorials that we've put like programming tutorials and labs that we put on GitHub. Um, and then they meet in their pods once a week uh, so that they get hands on assistance and kind of are able to build community that way as well. After the eight-week boot camp, they then do four months of self-guided learning. So our thought was that learners, especially people who have like never written a line of code before, hopefully by the end of the first eight weeks, they feel slightly more proficient and could at least take advantage of some of the beginner online courses for things like how to use Python or how to do MATLAB, et cetera. Um, so then during this four-month period, we asked learners to apply what they've learned uh, through online courses to their own research. Um, and they kind of can self-determine what they do during this period because each person has really diverse research needs. Uh, at the same time, we asked our TAs, similar uh, to the train the trainer model that ReproNim has, we asked our TAs, uh, now that you've kind of had the experience of being a TA and doing a boot camp, we'd like you to host your own adapted boot camp for your own specialized community. Um, and so they did their own projects and that took on a very uh, a varied uh format based on what they knew and what their communities were. And I'll talk about that in a second as well. Our long-term goals were for learners to gain proficiency um, and be able to start to integrate more rigorous data science methods into their own research. Um, and then for TAs to gain expertise in creating and hosting their own training programs so that they could hopefully uh, train other trainers, uh, which I like to call the, the best use of a Ponzi scheme, like a, a well-intentioned Ponzi scheme. <laughs> um, so that's kind of the program in a nutshell. We also had a third aim, and that aim was uh, to create a public web database of data science resources. Uh, we wanted the resources to be rehab specific, so things that people in rehabilitation research should be able to use. Um, and so I'll talk about that as well. So those were our three aims. Um, before we even started, though, be, due to feedback from reviewers, we were asked to do a needs assessment from the rehabilitation community. Um, so we did that before we started. We got 68 responses. Um, and overwhelmingly, what people said they wanted, uh, which was a little bit of a surprise to us, was community. So, um, I mean, obviously, they were also excited about having like training resources um, on different topics like data visualization and big data. 
Um, they were interested in data sharing, but the main thing that people said is they wanted to be part of a community that really emphasized open science and data science and sharing, um, almost like a call to change the culture in some sense. Um, not that the rehabilitation research field isn't already like pretty collaborative, uh, but it just wasn't a cultural norm to do a lot of data sharing. And I think we heard from the community that they want to have a bigger, a cultural shift essentially towards this direction. So um, because of that, we focused in Repo Rehab on building communities. So we did this online via Slack. We had regular Zoom meetings. Um, and then we had in-person conference meetups, which were also really exciting. Uh, oops, sorry. We also um, provide open access resources to our YouTube channel, GitHub, and our um, ser searchable database that I'll talk about. Uh, and then we try to provide leadership and training opportunities for fellows to then teach in their local communities. So the way that we divided the three aims for the grant is essentially, what will we do for the learners? What will we do for the TAs? Um, and then what will we do uh, for the database? So that's what I'll talk about now. So our first aim was to build a national workforce of rehabilitation researchers who are equipped with data science skills that they can apply to their own research. Specifically, we aim to recruit 20 learners a year to complete the eight-week boot camp and four-month self-guided project period. Uh, we actually ended up accepting 25 learners who, um, kind of surprising to us, spanned all career stages um, and all research areas and also all skill levels. So when we built the program initially, we thought this will be great for people who have never written a line of code in their life and can't take advantage of like online resources because they don't know how to even get started. Like they don't know how to how to download and install Python or you know something like that. Um, but what we found were that um, like actually a third of our learners ended up being pretty advanced. I would say more advanced than some of our like myself and some of our leadership team members. Um, but they were really interested in being part of Reaper Rehab because they wanted to learn the reproducible side. They wanted to learn about open science, um, about how to make their research, you know, more reproducible, about how to use GitHub um, and things like that. And they wanted to be part of this community. Um, so that was really exciting to us. We also had everyone from, you know, first year PhD students to like very established full professors. Um, people of all ages and people of all research areas. So that was really exciting. Um, we also ended up dividing the learners into pods like we, I mentioned before. Uh, anyone in the beginner to intermediate stage, we kind of put into a smaller pod, assuming that they would need more hands-on um, hands interaction with their TAs. And then we did have one pod, pod seven, uh, which was our like advanced learner pod. Um, these are people who are, are great at programming, but they wanted to learn the more reproducible side of things. Um, we created an eight week bootcamp curriculum with custom content based on what we thought that they would want to learn. Um, and we created full tutorial series on different topics, or we pulled existing tutorial series that are, were already there because we thought we don't need to reinvent the wheel in some of these cases. Um, but we did try to make sure everything was tailored and useful for people in the rehab research field. Um, we have a curriculum on GitHub, and then we also put all our videos on YouTube. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that the learners gave very positive ratings for the eight-week boot camp. Uh, we actually just completed the four-month uh, self-guided period, so we just completed the whole first year yesterday. <laughs> so um, hopefully we'll have more updates from that, and people are kind of wrapping up their projects to share. Um, but just hearing what people did during this time was really exciting and I think inspiring to a lot of us, especially on the leadership team. Um, for the second aim, this is for TAs. Um, so our goal was, uh, this is kind of a Ponzi scheme part of things. So to develop data science rehab researchers who have the capacity to teach and train other people. Um, so like I mentioned in the rehab field, there are people who come into rehab research that already have uh, programming skills. A lot of them come from engineering backgrounds um, or computer science backgrounds. They're like rehab engineers or something like that. Um, but we tried to gather as many as we could to be TAs in our program. And our hope is that next year, some of our learners will apply to be TAs and so on. So we recruited eight TAs to teach small pods of learners and then to create and lead their own workshops for their local communities. Um, we took eight TAs this year whose expertise was matched to our learners' needs. We provided guidance for them and their pods through the bootcamp. 
Um, and then they, uh, this has to be updated, but they just finished their own workshops and projects um, this past month. Uh, so for example, one of our TAs, Dr. Maggie French, um, is providing an applied learning case and bootcamp for using uh, like kind of like how to ensure that your electronic health records data is clean before you start analyzing it. Um, and she's doing that um, in conjunction with the Learn Network, which is a learning healthcare systems center, essentially. For, and it's one of these like um, five national rehabilitation research uh, NIH funded centers. So that was pretty cool. And then uh, Dr. Andrew Huyman, which is another TA, created a series of tutorials for how to incorporate big data sources on uh, geographic uh, metrics and pollution into your research in R. Um, and he actually now has a full uh, YouTube playlist um, to show people how to do that. And the TAs also gave positive ratings for the eight week boot camp. So these were our fellows. Like I said, um, they were distributed across all different levels. There were people from who had never written a line of code before to people who had written full software packages, but they all had an emphasis on medical rehabilitation research and clear project goals. Um, and similarly, RTAs also um, spanned a wide variety of backgrounds. Um, almost all were from the rehab field, uh, but we did take uh, one person who was a ReproNim fellow uh, because uh, we had her teach the advanced learners about some of the more reproducible side of things like GitHub um, and things like that. Uh, we created pods and then we also had curriculum for everyone. Uh, this is a curriculum overview. So for the first three weeks of the boot camp, we mostly did um, kind of uh, theoretical principles for rehabilitation or re reproducible rehabilitation, data management, um, FAIR principles, et cetera, et cetera. Then for four weeks, the pods did kind of like uh, whatever they needed to based on their learners' needs. So this is where the TAs really took the lead and tried to come up with their own curriculum um, for their specific learners. Um, and then we met back to discuss kind of what everyone was going to do for their self-guided learning based on what they knew. We did the self-guided learning part, and then we had the final uh, Reaper Rehab All Hands meeting where we got to see presentations from everyone on what they accomplished. Uh, so in terms of curriculum and content, uh, we created custom content for this cohort and uploaded it to the YouTube channel, as I mentioned. Pods met weekly to discuss troubleshoot and network. Um, the whole group met together at the beginning and end of the boot camp, and then again after four months. Um, and then learners pursued self guided learning while TAs hosted mini boot camps or created tutorials, like I mentioned. Uh, all our resources created were openly shared. Um, and we tried to do some community building via Slack and conference meetups. Um, but one thing that we're discussing now is maybe some more in person uh, interaction. Um, these are some of the feedbacks that we got. Uh, just, you know, we obviously asked, like, you know, did you learn what you thought you would? Did it meet your expectations? This is just like any other comments or questions. Um, and it's been really exciting for us to see um, that it was overall a good experience for many people. Um, and I think some of the learners similar to us had no idea really what to expect, but we're just hoping it would be good. Uh, and it turned out uh, pretty positive, I think. Um, in terms of other things that we did during this time, we really tried to grow our digital or like online community. So we have a website, we have a Twitter, a mailing list, a YouTube, and a GitHub. Um, we also hosted hacky hours, which we took from ReproNim, um, which are like happy hours, but we had different themes like data sharing, et cetera. Um, and that was kind of a way we instituted them kind of towards the end of the boot camp period. But um, I think moving forward, we'll try to do them more frequently throughout the whole time because it's a way for people to interact with others outside of their pods. Um, and then I think we're also pretty proud that we were able to accommodate three levels of learners. So in, you know, in the beginning, we were just thinking we would create content for beginning learners, um, but then ended up needing to have content for both beginning, intermediate and advanced learners. Um, so that was really exciting for us. Uh, and then for AIM-3, so this aim was to dis broadly disseminate knowledge by creating an online repository of curated rehab-specific data science resources that were organized by research er rehabilitation research area. Um, and we did this by creating a website that lists rehab-specific uh, resources in a searchable and interactive manner. Um, 
this is Repro Rehab DB. So this is what we've created. Uh, we manually curated 171 online programming courses that we thought would be useful for rehab researchers across the spectrum. So anything from like intro to Python to like deep learning, computer vision. Uh, and we also found and uploaded 51 open source data sets that are relevant for rehab researchers. So, uh, so I should say, we provide links to these data sets. So we are not um, the archive hosts ourselves because that would be a lot of work um, and probably redundant. So we just kind of have it searchable so you could find data sets relevant for what you want. We also created a custom backend system that allows any user, um, so anyone on this call or anyone watching this can go to Repo Rehab DB, create an account, and then you can add new resources, which we hope will reduce the manual effort on our end because people kind of are like, oh, they could be like, oh, I use this data set or I created this data archive and I wanna share it with the community. Um, it also allows people to rate and review existing resources, which we thought was very important because a lot of times um, people will put things out onto a repository, but then when you go to them, there's like, it's like missing half the data, there's no metadata, so you don't understand how to use it, or a course is supposed to be like intro to Python, but it's actually very advanced or it takes 10 hours and you don't learn um, that much. So um, we thought it'd be great for the rehab community specifically to be able to provide their feedback on these different resources. Uh, we have a three minute video tutorial on how to use it and that's on our YouTube as well. Um, and this is just to show you a screenshot of what it looks like. Um, you can search here and then you can click if you want. If you search everything, you'll get both um, courses and data sets, but you could also specifically just search for courses or just search for data sets. We tried to um, manually curate roughly how long we thought the course would take, the level, so like first time user, beginner, intermediate, or advanced, and keywords that would be related to it. Um, so hopefully you can take a look. We This was created by two uh, computer science students. Um, that are really amazing and they did it as a volunteer thing. So we very much appreciate Samyin Yi and Swapnil Arya. Okay, uh, and then in terms of next steps, so we just concluded uh, the first cohort uh, yesterday um, and we will continue to create and share content, especially upcoming TA content that the TAs are preparing. Um, we plan to continue updating Repro Rehab DB by continually adding new resources. Um, and now we're in the phase where we're kind of making adjustments and planning to launch applications for the 23 to 20, 2023 to 2024 year. And those should come out this summer. Um, in terms of discussion, so I think, you know, we really wrestled a lot with virtual versus in-person versus hybrid formats. Uh, when the grant got funded, things were still pretty virtual as for conferences as well as everything else, you know, but obviously times change so quickly. Um, and now there's a lot more in-person events again in hybrid formats. So um, one, some feedback that we received is that people would love to meet up in person to start off um, and then, you know, kind of go back and do the boot camp in a virtual format. Um, so we're trying to figure out the best balance for those things. We're also trying to improve virtual engagement. Um, so because it is a long program that goes for eight weeks and then four months, um, how can we maintain virtual participation and enthusiasm for the program uh, without being overbearing or like too intense? Um, so we're trying to incorporate some elements that will improve engagement as well. Um, and then for future directions, uh, we're applying now for supplements to hopefully be able to help people archive their data. So a lot of groups and teams that we talk to have huge data sets and they want to be able to archive their data, but that's honestly like not the highest priority and they need to analyze it and they need to get it out. Um, but there are supplements now that if we got them would allow us to actually provide some person hours to help people archive the data, scrub it, write scripts to, to filter it and organize it, et cetera. Um, and then also help people to make their software more robust. Um, and yes, I think that's basically where we're at. Um, I kind of left it open so that we could have some more discussion. Um, but that is about it. Okay, I'll stop sharing there. Or I can keep my slides up if that's good. Um, if you stop sharing, we can then see the uh, folks, but we yeah, can sure. pull those back on yeah. uh, if we need. Cool. Uh, sure. Thank you so much. That was cool. Yeah. Uh, being part of it, you know, Thanks. was was great. But again, 
in part because of the virtualness, I was never quite sure how many you know, people were there and out there. So uh, I know the TAs had much more sort of in-person you know, interactions mm -hmm. with folks. So that's great. Uh, to start off the discussion or questions, can you say a little bit about how much labor goes into creating the pods? And <laughs> that to me sounds like, I mean, it's a great thing to accomplish, but that sounds so yeah. challenging. So I don't know if there's anything yeah. else you can say about the creation of pods or the flexibility yeah. of that or, or something about the pods. Because again, I think it's yes. a blessing and a curse, I presume. Yeah. yeah, sure, sure. Well, first, I also forgot to give a big shout out to Angie Laird because, the, you know, Angie created the re the ABCD Repronym program, which was also an R25. And she kind of shared a lot of her guidance with us as we created Repro Rehab. Um, I think in that, in her case, she had like hundreds of applicants um, and it was really overwhelming. Uh, in our case, we didn't have as many applicants. Like we still had a lot, um, but not, not hundreds. So it was still feasible to um, do it manually essentially. Uh, so yes, it was quite a lot of work. I uh, interviewed and met with every single person um, that we took in either as a TA or as a learner. Um, and uh, we also, so I'll tell you, we first tried to do it in a slightly more automated way. So we just sent out a survey to everybody that we admitted, um, asking them kind of like to rate their proficiency on different um, programming languages and abilities, and then also tell us what their research interests were. Uh, but then when I got those back and I had to like manually sort through them and try to pair groups up, uh, it was still very confusing to me, like what their actual goals were or like kind of where their levels were. So then I met with every single person individually uh, and then I created pods from that. Um, so yeah, I don't know in terms of scalability, how it would scale if we had like tried to make it a lot bigger. Um, I think that for better or worse, the rehab community is relatively small right now, uh, so it's still an approachable way. And I do think that the magic of the program was in the pods and having these small groups that had relatively similar interests. So it's a so great question. Yeah. So your objective, despite how much people may want to do it, it would be to keep it sort of in this 20, 25, 30-ish uh, yeah. learners so that you can manage that with a finite number of TAs and create unequal mm -hmm. pods okay and again not I, yeah I mean I don't know I'm we're open yeah. you know like, because it's our first and you're part of us too so so you yeah. and I Dave are open to suggestions and feedback I mean I do think by at least making all the content available online anyone can do the tutorials and things um but to get the hands-on help which was really the like main part of this uh it, ha it has to be somewhat smaller yeah, yeah. thanks Dorota hi, hi Dorota Oh, Good to see you. <laughs> and yeah, thanks for sharing. So I was just wondering, because at some point you had on a slide that you are creating like 171 uh, courses. Yeah. And that sounded like huge uh, yeah. amount of work. Can you share something? Yes. Like, what do you mean creating and how did it go? Uh, sorry, what was the last uh, How uh, Can you share what do you mean by what did you actually do? do? Mm. Yeah, and how, how, how much time this took, yeah? <laughs> yes. So uh, let me, I'm just going to share this screen one more time just to highlight Coralie. So <laughs> Coralie Fedora was our program manager. Um, and she's the person that kind of oversaw the creation of the, the website and also manually curated a lot of the resources for us. Um, we also pulled in some people from our lab. Um, so Grace Song from my lab is an RA that also helped. But it took a lot of time. Uh, we were hopeful that the initial stages of doing it, like just seeding the database initially so that it would be useful to people, uh, putting in the manual effort initially would help people to then use it and update it for us kind of as we go. So you mean that you were taking someone else course and you were updating this? Uh, it means that we were like, we were searching the web for like yeah. all possible intro courses. So like we went on, you know, all the standard ones like Udemy, Coursera, et cetera, and tried to find all possible courses and fed those in. And then we also um, looked at rehab specific resources that were there. Okay. So you were not up updating the courses. We weren't updating the course. No, we oh. didn't create 171 courses. So I, I, I know. I was thinking that you were like, actually like, because that's sometimes like, our issue is like also like some discussion in Eponym. I remember discussing that, you know, sometimes that like the materials are 
uh, not up to date and like it's it requires like constant checking and yes. I was wondering yeah yeah so we don't do we just find them we look through the courses to get a feel of if they'll be appropriate for the yeah it's still it's still out of work. yeah and then we put it in but that to be honest that's part of our hope with having it rateable uh so you can give it like one to five stars and then yeah. like put okay. some comments so like if somebody tries one and it's like a deprecated resource or like it's no longer useful they could just comment and then we can go back and like remove them if they okay. if they feel it should okay. be removed so we're just it's essentially trying to crowdsource yeah. the maintenance and upkeep of that type of database. Yes, sounds good. Thank you. Yes, yeah, thanks. Other questions out there from Radio Listening Land? I'll throw out another one. <laughs> All these standard thing, and you foreshadowed it in the discussion section. Um, I know the rationale for why many of us think that a you know, trying to accomplish a whole training thing in a week, you know, or as a hackathon yeah. or as part of an OHBM hack or something is insufficient in many ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and ABCD reprenim and this are, you know, examples of things that take the, it's a very, it's a hard thing. You need to commit a lot of time and, you know, it's, it's, you know, an investment and, you know, hours mm -hmm. and hours, I mean, you know, 20 or 30 hours of, you know, stuff or more even, you know, that people are devoted to because there's a lot of stuff to learn. Yeah. Um, there's a trade-off, of course, and, and, and as, as you know, and we know about people's attention for those longer, you know, periods of time. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to applaud you know, both of these programs for, you know, taking this long version uh, of, of doing that. And I guess the question is, again, if you want to say anything about uh, again, the ch challenges of, you know, running a long program, you know, for six month, you know, type of thing versus, you know, shorter term types of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think this is an ongoing discussion. It was one of the reasons I was excited to talk with you guys here and, you know, forever, whoever watches later um, to get ideas and feedback about what we think the best approach is. Um, I think, for us, the reason we went with the longer one, especially that four month self guided period is because, you know, when you're first learning programming, it's really easy to like learn how to like type hello world and like print a statement or something. But then when it comes to actually applying it to your own research, it's so much more complicated. Um, so we wanted to give people time to be able to, to actually try to take what they learned and put it in their own research while they still had access to their TAs. Um, so the TAs, you know, they weren't meeting on a regular basis, but they were still available if people had questions. Um, you know, I think one of the pieces of feedback that actually came from David Cunningham, who's here, um, was to try to do more regular meetings with TAs during the um, self-guided portion as well, which I think is great. And we didn't really consider, we just kind of like threw everyone into the void and said, go for it. Uh, so I think we would provide a little more structure during the self-guided portion. But I still think that that is a useful thing just because people did seem to try at least to apply what they had learned to their own research. And um, I think unanimously they were, uh, everyone said they had been a little ambitious about their goals, which is I think how it goes when you try to apply programming to your research for the first time. Um, it always takes longer than you expect. And so I think it was good that we at least help people to get the ball rolling. Um, but yeah, I don't know that I have a good answer to if I think that's the right way to do it or not. Um, I think maybe time will tell. And the one good thing is it does seem like people are willing to continue what they've started. Um, maybe because they've invested time in it already, they have plans, you know, to like wrap this up for a poster or for a paper presentation or for a grant, um, which is really what we were hoping for. So, yeah. I think that'll be exciting to see is how much of this creates things that live longer than than yeah. this program. And again, I think this yes. is a good community for, for doing that. Yeah. In, you know. uh, Dorota, other question? Uh, I was just wondering, so do, do you think people still uh, stay in the spots? Do they still like, you know, uh, yeah. collaborate with each other? Uh, I think so. I mean, based okay. on what they were saying yesterday, like a lot, some people had like reached out to their TAs or uh, Yuki Yuki Anagita oh, okay. is also one of our learners, uh, and he's saying yes. <laughs> so, hi Yuki. <laughs> yeah, and maybe Yuki, do you want to say anything about your experience as a learner? Maybe that would be great. Um. Yeah. 
So yeah, I'm Yuki. I'm from Auburn, Auburn University. So I didn't have any coding background. So yeah, I learned a lot from this program. Um, I use a lot uh, Repro DB. Mm -hmm. I I my part was MATLAB, but I learned a lot like SQL, R, Python. So right now, I know like where I should go. So that was a good start for my learning. And also like repro rehab. So coding is a part of repro activity, not all. So, so I learned that is how to run stats to achieve like reproductivity and how to organize data, how to share data. So yeah. I learned a lot. <laughs> Thanks, Yuki. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even pay him to be here. <laughs> Thanks, Yuki. Do you, do you right. still keep in touch with your pod? Yes, yeah. Yes. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. These are the things that we actually don't know uh, in the leadership team side because we're not like in all of your daily communications, but that's great to hear. Yeah. Thanks. And oh, we I, did. Uh, oh, yeah, comment. great, David. Yeah. And a comment Thanks, to Yuki. that. Um, I was a learner in pod seven. Um, so you don't know what you don't know a lot of times. So I had a lot of background coming into it in terms of programming, but the way it goes is you teach yourself and then, you know, someone else is working on something. You're like, oh, I can easily apply that. But unless I'm able to figure that out on my own, but having the community based aspect of things allows you to just sort of learn things that you don't even know that you can even apply to what you're currently doing. Um, so, so it's just a great community building, um, community essentially. Thanks, David. I also didn't pay David to be here, but it's also great. Yeah, and I think for us, one of the things we liked hearing was like, I'm from Pod X. Like, we we literally just numbered the pods so that it was easy for us organizationally. But it kind of seems like it's created some identity for people to to like a community and like yeah. So I think that's fun for us to see. Hunger Games comes to, uh, yeah. to mind, but um, um, District Three. Yeah, and. <laughs> We emphasize, it was emphasized and again, once anyone, and this covers all the reprenim and the rehab, re, uh, the reprenim fellows and things like that. Once anyone's associated with any bit of reprenim, they are, you know, adopted, you know, for life mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, hopefully those pods live. And again, all these, you know, learners and TA, TAs, you know, you know, ultimately have access to the whole reprenim, you know, community and the whole mm -hmm. uh, repro rehab TA community. So that's great. I don't know that there was a lot of, interactions back you know to the mothership of repro nim nim uh but uh yeah. that's something that you know if there was any utility to that you know we could try to foster and facilitate more yeah i mean i think um because of the level of the learners they they're still kind of getting their feet wet but our goal is like eventually the the resources that have been made available by repro nim we also try to make available to repro rehab so that when they're ready for it they can access like the software what is it called? Coding mm. software carpentry. Yes. Like those types of resources. Yeah. And ultimately we'll turn them loose on data lad and Yarrick <laughs> and uh, NeuroDocker and Dorota and, and all the different yeah. tools. You know, That's right. I did get... consider, I did, I was like, should we have a hack hero with data lad? And then I was like, is that going to blow their minds? I actually did include a data lad video though on the data management. Um, curriculum week. So they did watch about it, the high level overview of kind of what it is and how it can work. Um, but yeah, yeah, hopefully there will be more integration. I think there was also talk of getting repo rehab tattoos at SFM this year for anyone interested. So just, it could be repro and then just blank and people can fill in what, what repro version they are part of. <laughs> and then uh, karaoke, I'm sure as well. Yes. The karaoke channel on the YouTube. I'm looking forward to it. Anyway. <laughs> yes. Other questions or comments out there? If not, I would love to uh, thank you again for uh, presenting this and thank you know, yeah. the uh, learners who are here. Okay. And um, yeah. again, as we did yesterday, thank you. Know, we at Reprenim are super happy when these types of technologies get reused into these specific communities. That's so helpful to our mission that you know you can 
be successful at you know, getting that funding and getting a whole new community you know engaged in this. So that is super great for our trickle down for our trickle down. You know, the Ponzi <laughs> yes, scheme, may, you know, may well. the Ponzi scheme live on. <laughs> Um, yes, so and yeah. we are, if anyone's interested, we're happy to always share our materials if you, if anyone wants to yep. create their own uh, offshoot of Repro something. So, yep. yes. So thank you so much to all of you. And thanks so much to Repro Nim. It's been a huge inspiration for me as well. And I have really appreciated learning from, from everyone here. Oh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks everyone. <laughs> Bye.